a production of the New Jersey Courts. You were on the appellate uh, court until uh, 2002? 2003. 2003. Yes. Okay. How did um, you first hear that your name was in contention for uh, well, um, the Supreme Court? I think the New Jersey Law Journal may have run a, uh, an article about uh, there was a Supreme Court opening when Justice Coleman was going to, had, uh, was going to retire. And uh, they... Uh, just as they normally do, list a couple of people that name might be uh, being considered, and uh, my name was one of those names, uh, and that's how I heard that I was involved. And uh, then uh, I don't know how I was given a an application, what the process was. I was certainly interested, uh, and uh, it was awkward for me to to do anything positive towards me, uh, when I say positive, any steps towards uh, that reality, uh, uh, that's not in my makeup, so to speak, and I just sort of waited for things to happen. Uh, and uh, uh, fortunately, good things happened, uh, and uh, I got a call from the governor's office to uh, uh, go uh, meet with him for an interview, Governor McGreevy. Uh, this was, uh, I think, in April uh, now, so for a month or so before, there had been a number of names and people involved, and uh, uh, I, I was interested but didn't know where I was in the scheme of things. Um, and then as it uh, turned out, I met with the governor uh, uh, in Princeton, and uh, on a Saturday, I think it was, no, I think it was a Friday evening, Friday afternoon, and uh, it was a good interview, and things went well, and at the end of the interview, he asked me if I had any questions. And I said, yes, just one. Um, when do you intend to make your decision? Because uh, I'm still in the appellate division, and Judge Prester, who was my presiding judge, had sort of taken me off of cases uh, since my name was in the, in, out there. And uh, uh, it was sort of an imposition to the appellate division during the process. So I, I'm anxious to find out yes or no in some way or another. And uh, the governor, to my surprise, uh, said he had made his decision and I was it. So I was shocked when I heard it and uh, wasn't sure how to respond, but I s said graciously, thank you. And he said, I'd like to make a, uh, an announcement of it first thing tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Well, I said, well, I'm sorry, governor, but uh, I have a baseball game tomorrow at nine. I can't make a nine o'clock appointment. Um, and he said, well, we'll do it at two o'clock or one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, would your game be over? Can you be here by then? And I said, certainly that would work well. Um, so uh, I was able to coach my little league game and then uh, the next day and then reported to the governor's mansion where they had the announcement and uh, um, it went very well. So um, can you, Give us a flavor of like what what does the governor ask you in an interview like that? Uh, well, uh, Just I in general. I, I, yeah, I, I was gonna say I'd rather not be the one to. Uh, but he, a lot of uh, first of all, my interview was initially with the I think his chief of staff, and there were a number of questions about uh, 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 composure, treatment of people, uh, how you handle things, and uh, general questions about uh, being a good. Uh, Good justice, um, and then uh, near the end of the interview, the governor came in and we spoke uh, uh, privately. And I, I would not, uh, I do not think it appropriate that I discuss sure. the issues that we talked about. But uh, they were all all uh, good things and uh, positive, uh, and uh, I respect the governor for uh, what he was, was saying to me. And um, as I said, then it ended up with a a question and answer that uh, he surprised me with the prompt answer uh, that was in my favor. So what, what happens next? Do you start 
working with the um, judicial committee? Uh, uh, yes. Then yeah. uh, the that's the governor's process is started. Then the uh, judicial committees look at uh, your recommendation and uh, the application. The, it was a four-way check, uh, so to speak, and um, all the checks came out favorable. And uh, the next thing uh, was the actual ceremony, and the, the governor was uh, gracious enough to allow me to have it uh, my formal swearing-in ceremony at Rowan University. Um, so it was close to home, and a lot of friends were able to get there because it was much more convenient. Although the weather was not very conducive to the, the uh, ceremony, it was raining that day, but it, uh, the location was wonderful. Now, um, a lot of the uh, press uh, around this time, you know, noted that you were the first South Jersey representative on the court since the, I think the early 70s. Yes. Um, you know, what, what do you think that means in terms of, you know, representation and, you know, it, is it as important an issue as, as the press makes it out to be? I personally do not think it is, but I think it is from the general perception of people in South Jersey that at least people in this area of the state uh, are recognized for to do uh, response take on responsible positions throughout the state government, whether it's in the uh, legislature or the judiciary, um, and it's not one part of the state, but now the entirety of the state is involved. Mm. So to that extent, I think it's good. Uh, uh, the court has always had good people. Uh, I mean, I've always been very uh, respectful and uh, regard the New Jersey Supreme Court very highly. Um, and I didn't look at where they were from. I looked at what they did. Mm. Now, uh, tell, tell us about uh, getting into the actual work of the court. Uh, any memories maybe from your first conference or first experiences going to the courthouse? Uh, well, I remember that uh, my expectation was that I would not have to work as hard as I did on the appellate division. Uh, but I was wrong. Uh, I, I went in, I, uh, I think I may have sat in one session of the court as a guest, uh, just sitting in the, in the conference room around the table. Um, the setup would be the Chief Justice was at the uh, very end and then the most senior would be uh, to his right and then on down uh, the table, the most junior uh, sitting where you are. And uh, they discussed the cases and I noticed how each justice knew every, all the issues in the case and was able to discuss it and how they uh, came to a conclusion and rendered a decision for that part of the discussion. And then the Chief Justice would assign who would write the opinion. Uh, and, and that was really it uh, as far as my exposure before I was then uh, put to the test, so to speak. Uh, fortunately, I, w I came on, uh, I think it was the end of May. So the argument portion of the uh, calendar year was essentially completely completed. They then have summer uh, sessions uh, through uh, first week of July. And so th they are writing their opinions. Since I said on none of those cases, I had no opinions to write. Uh, so that was probably the easiest time of my uh, judicial uh, term. I never thought of it this way, but as far as the amount of work I had to do, now I'm just uh, uh, looking at petitions for certification, that is, see which cases the court's going to decide, uh, because they have not yet been given the assignments to review for the cases that will start in September. So for a, a short window, I had a, it was a nice, period, June, July of uh, 2003, as far as the quantity of work. Uh, uh, but then, of course, that picked uh, up uh, uh, near the end of August when you start getting the assignments for the, the new term. And uh, now uh, there aren't as many cases on the docket, but they're more in-depth uh, review and analysis. Uh, you uh, now have another layer of uh, briefs to read uh, that are in the file. 
However, unlike the appellate division, you have a memo from a law clerk on every case that uh, you're going to decide. Uh, but now the, uh, it's not the uh, assignment judge or the presiding judge that makes the assignment of which clerk does the memo, but the, the clerk of the court. Uh, he will assign various uh, clerks of the judges as to what assignment they have. Each justice has uh, three, uh, three law clerks. Of course, the chief has uh, more because of administrative responsibilities. And at, th at, at that time, there was, uh, we had the death penalty. Uh, so that was, uh, they had a special clerk helping with the death penalty issues. So there were more law clerks, but it, this is just a long way of saying that each law clerk was given an assignment of a matter that was on for argument. And there may be four cases uh, a day over, or four or five cases over for each day uh, of the argument period, which would be, say, Monday, Tuesday, there'd be five one day and five the next day. And I could be wrong on the number, but uh, that's about the number, uh, about 10 cases of it for that weekly cycle, bi-weekly cycle. Um, and it was different to me because the appellate division, you did most of the, <coughs> of the decision-making before the argument. When I say decision-making, your thought process is going through the case, analyzing it, and then when you got the argument, you had a pretty good feel for the case. Uh, as I was saying, the, the appellate division do a lot of decision-making uh, before the argument, and then uh, you may change your mind based upon the argument, and then you conference it afterwards. Whereas on the Supreme Court, uh, you have the arguments on Monday, Tuesday. From Tuesday through the following Tuesday, you are going more in depth in the uh, cases that were argued and uh, deciding how you want to recommend to the court that it, the case be decided. Of course, the following Tuesday, you come back and at conference, um, the chief may call on you at random to recite basic facts of the case and recommend uh, a conclusion. So you have to be prepared to uh, um, analyze each of the, let's say there are 10 cases, uh, and, and make decisions. You may hear a comment that changes your mind. Um, you're not supposed to talk to the other justices. Unlike the appellate division where you spoke with the other side judges about the case before, uh, you don't do that generally in the Supreme Court. You come to the panel fresh uh, with your thoughts in mind, uh, not having distributed your thoughts in writing to the other justices beforehand, and you talk about the case and reach a conclusion. Um, so I wasn't used to that process. I learned it. I, I was more in favor of the appellate division process, uh, but uh, it's because that's what I was used to. But I learned that the uh, uh, Supreme Court process worked. They wanted everybody to give their views uh, as to how the case should be decided, and uh, it, uh, it, it worked. Uh, and then, of course, the opinion writing uh, is, uh, is a lot of work as far as, because uh, you're now establishing the law. This is the law for the state of New Jersey in that particular case. Uh, and those issues, uh, uh, very few cases go to the US Supreme Court from the New Jersey Supreme Court. There are some, but not, but not a lot. Um, so uh, uh, as some judges have, and justices have said, uh, uh, we're not right so much because we're right on the law, but we're final. And that's, that's the decision that uh, the person or parties have to live with. Uh, so there's a lot of responsibility and a lot of work that goes into making sure that you get it right. Well. Um can I ask you about some of the cases? Sure. Uh, just any memories you might have. Um, I wanted to ask about your uh, earliest, I guess, major opinion that you wrote in State versus Bellamy. Yes. Um, what do you What do you remember about that case in general? And was what, was Bellamy uh, again? This was a, uh, a a person who had pled guilty but didn't understand that they oh, were yes. pleading okay. guilty. <coughs> yes. And so far as uh, again, you know, having set and heard. A lot of these guilty pleas, uh, uh, an individual should be uh, advised of uh, what the consequences of, of the plea are going to be, not just that 
they're going to get a certain number of years, but there may be other consequences. Uh, and I, I'm not so sure what every, uh, what, I don't remember exactly what Bellamy involved the, but it was an issue that uh, we felt uh, on the court that uh, the person should have been advised of, and they were not, and we set additional guidelines as to uh, ensuring that the uh, defendant was advised of all the uh, particular consequences. Was, was that a... Uh, I think it was somebody who was trying to uh, um, pay a prostitute or something and... and no, what, what were yeah. the consequences that they were oh. not advised, advised of? Do you um, the possible consequences under the Sexually Violent Predator Act. Oh yes, that uh, the, those consequences as far as what they were, uh, I think uh, now being part of the registered uh, sex offender list, uh, that all those issues should be made known to the defendant before he pleads guilty. Um, also, uh, two cases that I, I think you were working on uh, fairly close together, State versus Moore and State versus Panero, uh, which dealt with, um, uh, uh, I guess, Fourth Amendment issues regarding uh, seeing drug transactions and that sort of thing. Yes. Um, one where the police um, thought they had witnessed a uh, drug transaction uh, because of money exchanging for small objects, the other involving a pack of cigarettes, mm -hmm. or, or I, I assume drugs in a pack right. of cigarettes. Um, anything stand out about those? No, I, except I, as I recall, I thought they were fact sensitive issues that uh, uh, one may have been uh, articulable suspicion and the other not. I, I don't recall exactly the facts, but uh, the, the facts were uh, of what the police observed, um, whether a reasonable person in that position would have concluded that they it was criminal activity, uh, and I, I'm not. I think maybe one we said yes, and the other may have said no, or the vice versa. But uh, it was a fact-sensitive case dealing uh, based on the law. Um, so before we get into some uh, specific cases, uh, I wanted to just ask some general questions about how you make decisions or approach your work on the Supreme Court. Uh, so first, um, uh, I noticed in the, the records that, uh, as you mentioned here, you only had one dissent during your time on the appellate division, but there were a number of dissents uh, dur during your uh, time on the New Jersey Supreme Court. Um, why, why did you uh, uh, go about your job on the Supreme Court a bit differently in that regard? Well, I think part of it may have been the way the decision-making process in the appellate division compared to the Supreme Court is set up. I may have mentioned that in the appellate division, um, you sent out a memo uh, saying to the other judges how you would decide the case, and they did the same with you, and then you discussed it and tried to uh, meld your views to be consistent, uh, whereas on the Supreme Court, you don't discuss the case with the other justices beforehand. Uh, you go back to your chambers, or you uh, write up a recommendation, and you sort of cement your view a little more, a little stronger view, because now you're pres when you do present it to the court in your conference, you're trying to convince the other members of the court to decide your way. So you have uh, given a, a stronger presentation, and uh, you think your view is right, because that's the way you analyzed the law and decided it uh, when you did an in-depth review. And I think because of that, uh, there's more of a likelihood that if you do not agree with the uh, majority viewpoint, that you feel compelled to let uh, the world know how you think the case should have been decided and why. And I, that's why I've, uh, I've dissented more in the Supreme Court. Again, maybe my view would not have been as strong if I had discussed the case beforehand with other justices and got their uh, views and th said yay or no whether or not I should move in mine. Uh, but because of the structure that you get the opportunity to express your view after the case has been argued, when it's about ready to be decided, uh, and you've done a lot of work on it, uh, you feel more compelled to write a dissent at times. Now, um, you served under three chief justices? That's correct. Yes. 
Chief Justice Debbie Poritz, uh, Chief Justice James Azali, and Chief Justice Stuart Ratner. Okay. And I was curious, uh, any, uh, first for any uh, reflections you have on, on them, working with them, their style, and if there are any differences in, in the court from, from one Chief Justice to the next that you could point to? Uh, I would only point out that I have the deepest respect uh, and admiration for each three of them. Uh, they treated me wonderfully. They uh, uh, treated uh, the issues on the court fairly. I liked the way they decided cases. They worked hard. They have a, a great administrative uh, workload in addition to what they do as far as opinion writings. They may take lesser number to write, opinions to write, but they normally take some of the harder cases. Uh, well, most of them are hard. Uh, uh, some are even uh, harder than others. So uh, uh, they, but it's their decision as to which ones they'll take. And it, uh, uh, they, they were all wonderful. And uh, I was very happy to work with each one of them. And, um, you know, what kind of sense of collegiality was there on the Supreme Court when you were serving on it? Uh, there was a, uh, it was a great collegial court. Uh, I love working with each one of them. Uh, we would uh, come to court and uh, uh, be strong in our views insofar as uh, how the case should be decided, talk to one another, uh, uh, but have, uh, have good friendship when we dis did not agree all the time. Uh, I remember Justice Vera Soto, when, if someone's birthday, he'd bring a cake in. Um, uh, he was always very uh, uh, generous in, in so far as that is concerned. Uh, one of the nice things that when I mention his name is that uh, he and I are both from the South Jersey area. He lives in Haddonfield. I live in Washington Township. So uh, we were both very strong Eagles fans. So uh, the, uh, the Monday, the Eagles play on Sunday. The Monday after an Eagles game, uh, I'd, I'd come in with an Eagles tie and he'd, have, he'd wear his he wear a bow tie, and he wear an Eagles bow tie. So we uh, we sported our Eagles attire uh, after an Eagles victory, and uh, most of the other justices were Giants or Jets fans. So uh, we had a little back and forth, but it was all good banter. Um, well, I, I wanted to ask about some specific cases. Yes. Um, the first uh, was the. Uh, DeAngelis, uh, I just want to get the name right, uh, DeAngelis versus Hill case. Yes, that was a defamation action, if I recall correctly. Um, and uh, I think briefly the uh, defendant had uh, uh, been treated unfairly by a police officer in some way and ultimately end up uh, uh, printing pamphlets of some sort uh, disparaging uh, the veracity of the police officer and uh, the police officer sued for defamation. We, uh, we held that uh, uh, the standard, uh, because the police officer was a public uh, official, that uh, there must be malice shown by the defendant on the uh, defendant's behalf before he could be found guilty. Uh, and uh, as a result, I think the case was ultimately dismissed because of that. Um, State versus Townsend? Uh, if you can just give me a brief... Yeah, it's uh, uh, regarding um, uh, the battered woman syndrome. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah that was a, a case um, in which uh, we held that the, uh, uh, ex there could be expert testimony about uh, uh, battered women and battered women syndrome uh, that could be developed in the case and the expert could use the testimony of, about the conduct as a basis for his opinion that uh, the person was subject to the syndrome. I think the evidence had been excluded below and uh, so as a result it was remanded for a new trial. All right. Next, um, you know, one of the issues that uh, we've been covering through these interviews is how technology and changes in technology have yes. influenced uh, the court um, and its decisions. and. You dealt with uh, a DNA case, uh, known officially as uh, AA versus the Attorney General of New Jersey. Um, what, do you, what do you recall about that? Yes, uh, I think there were two companion cases. One, 
the AA and State another was a State versus O'Hagan. State versus O'Hagan. Uh, AA may have been a juvenile, O'Hagan, or vice versa. I'm not sure which one, but um, we found that the evidence was strong, sufficiently strong that uh, uh, DNA evidence uh, was uh, was valid um, evidence to be used, and that the uh, procedure set up for taking the uh, DNA uh, analysis was sufficient, and that uh, as long as the statutory criteria were met, it was uh, valid for the state to uh, extract the DNA from the defendants, both uh, juveniles as well as adults. Um, I'm curious, uh, when you have a case like that, how much uh, education, I guess, is involved in it? Like get, bringing yourself and the justices up to speed on what's happening technically? Well, part of the record in, includes a lot of the uh, expert development of DNA and uh, uh, how valid it is and uh, so on. So uh, that was part of the record and uh, it was, again, all the justices that read what's in the record, so that's available, and they're they're aware of it when you discuss the case around the room. So it's not that I had to bring them up to speed; they were right there, and I think they were both unanimous unanimous opinions, if I recall correctly. All right, and uh, oh. Yes, uh, State versus D'Angelo, which was a First Amendment case regarding signage. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I think that was a, uh, a case where the, uh, the town may have had an ordinance that uh, said that they, you couldn't uh, put up uh, signs generally. And in this, it was a, uh, a labor dispute, and they had, I think, their, what they call the rat, or the, uh, some uh, form put up as a, a form of expression. And we held that that uh, uh, zoning ordinance was unconstitutional as applied to that conduct to prohibit it uh, under the First Amendment. And um, towards the, the end of your tenure on the court, there was the state versus uh, Nunez Valdez case. Yes, that was another plea uh, type issue where um, uh, a uh, immigrant defendant uh, pled guilty and uh, was only uh, deported as a result of his plea, <coughs> excuse me, and on the post-conviction relief proceeding, he sought relief saying his counsel was ineffective for not having advised him of the deportation consequences as part of his plea. Uh, the trial court granted that uh, relief and uh, uh, we banned it for a trial on certain issues. And uh, uh, we ultimately upheld that decision, found that uh, the uh, deportation issue was an important issue that should be uh, presented to the defendant before he pled guilty if he was an immigrant, and therefore uh, affirmed the trial court's decision. Well, um, In incidentally, that, that issue uh, was also uh, later uh, heard before the U.S. Supreme Court, and they agreed with uh, with our conclusion. Different case, but same issue. Um, so, just in looking over the body of your opinions written, they seem to, I mean, they're all over the place, uh, as any judge uh, is in terms of subject matter. Um, but, you know, you seem to have gotten a lot of First Amendment cases, uh, family uh, related cases um, as well as you know like Fourth Amendment cases that sort of thing do you think there was uh, any reason why you were picked for particular uh, opinions or a particular subject area well some because I may have expressed an interest in mm -hmm. others because uh, the Chief Justice may have thought I had experience in that area that could help uh, and then I I don't know what goes into the mind of the Chief Justice when he or she makes the assignment. They do it on, on their own from their own analysis. Uh, sometimes it may be that your clerk did the memo, the bench memo in the case. Sometimes it may be that uh, uh, the Chief Justice knows that you like a particular area of the law. Uh, uh, they knew of my experience in the, uh, as a trial court in the, in the criminal area 
in the civil area, in the family court area. So uh, uh, these may be reasons that the Chief Justice is making that decision, but it's, it, it's not mine. Uh, in a few of the cases, and very few, I may have expressed an interest in writing the opinion, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the opinion. Uh, but that's uh, in a uh, more than short answer, uh, the response. Uh, I really don't know the answer to why I got these, all these cases. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, going back to the issue of geography and uh, being for a while at least the only uh, South Jersey representative on the court, um, do you think there's ever an issue of, well, this is focused on South Jersey, so we'll, we'll have you take it? No. Okay. Uh, I, none of the cases that did I get that idea at all. Okay. Uh, and I was only on the court for a year before Justice Vera Soto came on. So we had uh, two South Jersey people uh, for uh, at least most of my term on the court. When you uh, were on the court, where were your chambers? My chambers, uh, which is uh, one of the reasons we're in this building today, uh, my chambers were in this building. Uh, I rented space on the second floor of this building. I think you were up in my office mm -hmm. where I am now. Uh, at that time, uh, we rented the entire second floor, and that was the court chambers. The stairwell that uh, you may have or may not have walked up was not present, and you entered from the second floor to my, my chambers. So my three law clerks and my secretary and I shared the second floor. And one of the nice things about coming here is that I got a chance to stay in essentially the same chambers that I was in while I was on the Supreme Court. Uh, we had parking below uh, for the court, so it was uh, uh, an easy transition for me because uh, I had a uh, tough decision as some of the uh, nice law firms that I had uh, possibilities of going with. Uh, during your time on the Supreme Court, you, uh, you know, worked with a lot of law clerks. They're a very integral part of the Absolutely, yes. Procedure. Any, any uh, memories of working with law clerks, or what, what did you look for in a law clerk? Well, uh, I look forward to a well-rounded uh, individual. I didn't always take the traditional law student that uh, just went through college, law school, and so on. Uh, I look maybe for some experience outside of law that uh, if a teacher went to law school after a while, uh, I made, that was a plus on the application. If they uh, did uh, activities in school, uh, that was always a plus. I, I look for things other than good grades and able to do it. I wanted a well-rounded individual in addition to uh, uh, being a, a very intelligent person. And I, was, uh, I thought I was successful over the years. Uh, one of the nice things that uh, this county, when I say this county, Gloucester County has, is that each year there's an annual judges law clerks dinner. That dinner is for all judges, uh, Superior Court judges, active and retired, uh, with all their law clerks. Uh, those coming in as well as all past law clerks are invited back for a dinner. And uh, it's an evening of just celebration, having a good time. Mm. I think we're the only county that does that. And it's a very nice annual affair. In addition, uh, I have a, a sort of cookout uh, 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 during the summer for all of my law clerks that are always invited. That's for their families as well as the law clerks, so it's a good chance to catch up on uh, how they're doing. Uh, I always consider my law clerks my second family that uh, I now, it, it's growing when they have children and so on. Uh, one of them going to college, so it's, uh, it's always a fun time to get together and talk and find out what's happened over the course of the year. Um, so, in addition to the heavy workload of uh, being a justice, uh, were you given any other assignments um, uh, over the course of your tenure there? Uh, when you say other assignments, other than committee work? Yeah, uh, yeah, well, like committee work, that sort of thing. Yes, uh, I, I, I did some uh, uh, committee work. Uh, each uh, justice is assigned uh, to be like the lead justice for various committees of the Supreme Court. On a, on a standing basis. Uh, in addition, there may be a special assignment that may come up that the Chief Justice may want uh, you to chair or to sit in on that uh, 
uh, that committee. Uh, that kind of thing that all, all the justices do as part of their uh, being a, a justice of the Supreme Court. But uh, I think the, the chief recognized that I had a lot of outside activities in, my, in the sports area that I have uh, been involved in while on the court and uh, was probably a little easy on me as far as uh, those special assignments. I, I did not have very many. Mm. And so you were able to continue coaching? I was. Time? I was. Uh, throughout my uh, judicial period, I guess I started just before I went in the Pell Division. Uh, started, uh, well, let me say this. I always coached uh, Little League and Babe Ruth baseball because that was during the summertime uh, and evening hours and on the weekend. So it did not interfere with my uh, work time, whether I was a lawyer or whether I was a judge. Uh, then when I went on this uh, appellate division, with the flexibility, I then uh, started doing high school uh, football. It was an opportunity that arose because I, I went into, I was coaching midget football. And again, those programs are normally in the evening hours, so it's okay to adjust with your uh, nine to five, nine to six time. Uh, but when I went on the appellate division, I said I was flexible so I could leave my chambers in the afternoon uh, other than on argument days and then go to practice. Uh, and a volunteer, I didn't have to be at every practice, but uh, and games were Friday night or Saturday afternoon. So there were times that I did not have a conflict with on the bench uh, and it, it worked extremely well for me. So uh, I was able to continue those activities uh, while I was on the court. Uh, and if there was a special uh, event, say in uh, uh, football or baseball that I had to leave early, uh, the Chief Justice was, he or she was always accommodating. And I was able to leave the court session early. So um, I'm curious, uh, you, you were uh, coaching on the high school level. Um, was that just for football or, or baseball too? That was just for football Okay. Uh, while I was on the court. Okay. Um, it has changed since I, I'm no longer on the court. Uh, I, uh, one of the uh, football coaches that I coach football with uh, uh, for the past 10 years uh, was also the uh, ninth grade girls basketball coach. So he asked me to uh, help him out uh, since I had a little bit more time on my hands. So I agreed to do that. He was also the junior varsity baseball coach uh, and asked me to help him that. So I said yes, because I, I love the game of baseball. Uh, so I agreed to do that. Uh, and this year it's even changed more because um, my junior varsity coach as a result of a, a resignation of the varsity coach moved up to the varsity. So now I'm helping with the varsity uh, baseball program at Washington Township this year. Just curious, had you sent anybody to uh, UDEL, uh, either in football or baseball? I, uh, I try to influence them to make a decision in that direction. Uh, not many have uh, followed up on it and gone to the University of Delaware. Although a, a couple have, and one of them, uh, uh, Scott Young, who was uh, an early Little League player for me, this is before I, be, I came on the bench. Uh, he followed and went to the University of Delaware, was an outstanding pitcher and uh, uh, did extremely well, uh, went on the minor league and played with the St. Louis Cardinals organization for some time. Mm -hmm. Then came back and was a coach in the Washington Township program and then on to Violin High School where he was a varsity coach. Um, all right, so any other memories of your time on the court that uh, you'd like to share? Any, any experiences that we hadn't really covered? Uh, not real experiences other than the mention of, of well, uh, a couple of more of the lighter side uh, sure. experiences. Uh, one of the nice things in the appellate division, at the end of each term, uh, in May or June, uh, the, the part would get together at some social function. And the year that I sat with uh, Judge King as my presiding judge in the appellate division, uh, it was uh, Richard Newman and uh, Bob Fall, and with Judge King as the presiding judge, uh, we decided to... Uh, go to uh, Lebec Finn in Philadelphia for, at that time, was a, a very exclusive restaurant and had a wonderful uh, uh, luncheon spread. Uh, it was like a, a buff, buffet type menu. And uh, you take your, your law clerks as well as 
uh, your secretary. And uh, so there's a nice sized crowd that we went over to the Lebec Finn and had a wonderful uh, meal. And uh, they had a dessert cart that was had two tiers. And you know, when your dessert cart comes out, you normally take one of the desserts. And so Judge King sort of said, give me one of each. And so they cut it up. He had uh, a potpourri of uh, desserts, uh, which you could do. Uh, and we had such a great time together. That, uh, we did it uh, from that year for the next 10 years. Right. Even though I was, when I was on the Supreme Court, we did it. Uh, even after Judge King had retired, we went out together uh, until uh, we, his health uh, prohibited us from all getting together. So it was, uh, that was one of the nice sidelights. Uh, I mentioned about the dinner the clerks have uh, uh, that uh, that social aspect of it, and uh, Richard Newman, we called it the the, the social chairman of our, our part. Uh, we never sat together as a part again after that one year, but we socialized together thereafter because we had such a good time. So you um, kind of explain how you came here uh, after your time on the court. Um, what kind of law do you practice here at uh, uh, Brown? Brown Cottery? Yeah. Uh, presently, I am doing uh, mediation and arbitration work uh, where individuals will ask me to try to mediate a case for them. Uh, I also get involved with uh, uh, giving expert advice insofar as uh, how to write appellate briefs, uh, uh, discussing various issues that would be presented to the court. Uh, that's generally the, uh, the type of work I do. Occasionally I get a request to assist in uh, an issue that the law firm may have to give them advice. Um, and then in the other case that the court, the uh, firm has, uh, if they seek assistance on in uh, handling the case, I'll, I'll help them there. And um, you've described a little bit about your outside activities and coaching. Any other community activities or, or uh, youth athletic activities? Uh, I think I have probably uh, confined it now to those activities. I, I did, uh, at one time, I was a uh, member of the Board of Trustees at the University of Delaware, and uh, that was an uh, interesting experience over the years um, that I served. Um, I'm now a trustee at the Legal Services of New Jersey. I also am on the uh, 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 William Hughes Stockton uh, Division uh, on their their directors, so, uh, so I, I keep involved. I, I think I limit mostly to mostly educational uh, aspects, but uh, my other chair uh, committee uh, involvement deals with, uh, it's now Jefferson Health. Uh, it used to be Kennedy, uh, in the Kennedy Health System mm -hmm. from Washington Township. Now uh, with the merger with Jefferson uh, Hospital, it's uh, Jefferson Health. Um, so I just want to ask maybe one or two general questions about how the law has changed over the, your career. Um, going back to the beginnings of our conversation, you were often describing how you would be one of a few or maybe the only African American in whatever situation you were in, and that um, sometimes there'd be very few women as well. Today, that's that's changed quite a bit. Do you think it's it's had the success that you would hope for, um, and also how? How do you think the uh, uh, greater integration of uh, women and minorities into the profession has affected and improved the impression? The, uh, well, I, I think profession. it's def I definitely think it's improved the system because now people, a lot of people coming into the system, uh, feel that they'll be given a much fairer shake. Doesn't mean that they are. Doesn't mean that they wouldn't have been given as fair a shake. But the appearance and how they perceive. What's going to happen, I think, is a lot better. Uh, we, uh, I, I don't know the percentages in each of those categories, uh, but it has improved. Uh, and uh, it, the court continues to get better insofar as the number of minorities and the number of uh, uh, females that are uh, uh, entering and having judgeships and deciding matters that uh, uh, sometimes uh, other individuals may not have been as sensitive to various issues that they may be uh, very sensitive to. 
Uh, what do you see as the biggest changes in the profession over your time? Well, uh, one of the biggest changes, I think, is how you decide your case, the research part of it. Uh, you know, there was at one point, uh, Lexis, uh, um, first of all, you, you, you had the books, and everything was done by uh, doing your research and uh, uh, citing and reciting and uh, researching the cases. Um, you know, now you, you go on a computer and you hit a few buttons and you get all the cases for that, uh, that particular issue. I mean, it, it's easier, but it's, you, you have to know how to do it. Uh, so uh, the computers have made a big difference in the development of your, the process of deciding the case. And I think it's an improvement. Uh, it's, it's efficient. Uh, there are some dinosaurs like me that are still out there that uh, need to uh, see a piece of paper also, uh, or would like to see a, a piece of paper in addition to what's on the screen of the uh, computer. But uh, it, it's amazing uh, how uh, people have the ability to even draft the opinion right on the, on the screen, uh, do it uh, without the need for uh, legal uh, secretary to, uh, to do the work for them. That's a, to me, that's a major change uh, from the way I would, uh, would have done it. Um, anything else you'd like to share with the record? Uh, I don't, whether, don't know whether I mentioned my experience as a, a baseball player uh, at the University of Delaware. Uh, Not that, too much, but please. All right, that was, uh, that was a good time for me. I, I love the game of baseball. I guess you from, hear from my coaching. But uh, I was uh, at Delaware at that time. Uh, uh, if you were there playing football, in the spring there was a spring football practice. So you could generally couldn't play a spring sport. You could not your freshman year. All freshmen had to go out for spring football. Uh, thereafter, if you played a spring sport and won the varsity team, you did not have to participate in spring football. So uh, beginning with my sophomore year, I tried out for baseball and I did not make the team. Uh, and uh, my, you know, I mentioned my friend Clint Ware. Uh, he was also a baseball player and he and I both got cut from the, did not make the baseball squad. So we had to play spring football that, that season. Uh, Clint turned out to be uh, a specialist on the defensive side for, uh, and they wanted to, to develop that part in spring football training. And they did, and he was outstanding. Um, and uh, I, on the hand, just went through the spring football. I had my, had a decent season, but it was spring football. Didn't count for other than getting ready for the, the fall. Uh, the, the following year, uh, my junior and senior year, I uh, went out and made the uh, baseball team and uh, um, contributed. Uh, we were MAC champions my senior year. Um, several years later, I did not realize that I had uh, been the first African American to play baseball at Delaware. And they, uh, they did a little a story, uh, uh, I think on Jackie Robinson's anniversary, they did a story about me uh, comparing with Jackie Robinson uh, with the college baseball as opposed to Major League Baseball, which was a very interesting article. Um, and that uh, pretty much sums up. You've heard a lot about me. Uh, I've had a lot of good mentors, a lot of good uh, judges I've sat with over the year. I'm very fortunate in my life. Thank you very much. We really appreciate My it. My pleasure, Sean. Thank nice, you so much. Nice sitting with you.